loudness. I can actually hear it when it's that loud. It might be a little too loud for you, but I'm in like the dead zone back here. Is anyone else struggling with the daylight savings change? Like our sound guy didn't show up this morning. He's locked in his room sleeping. Like uh, there's a few people who were like, well, we can't make it. It's the last second. So I was joking around with the, uh, the worship team this morning going to this morning is what we're going to call the survival of the fittest. <laughs> For those of you, <laughs> I don't know about fittest. For those of you who were able to wake up, oh my. And especially for those of you with children who are able to do that, because we know the, the adjustment for us as adults is hard, but for those with little kids, just this transition is never the easiest thing for them. So hopefully down the road in the future, we don't have to do this anymore. That's not in my hands. Let us go before our Heavenly Father in prayer. Let us pray. Father, we come before you this morning to worship you. We love you, Father, for you are so good to us. We look at what you have done to your creation, what you have done with your creation, and we realize that we have rebelled against you. And yet, out of your amazing grace, you sent your son to redeem us. For that alone, Lord, we stand in awe. We realize we don't deserve your forgiveness, but you have let us know that before the foundations of the world, you chose us and blessed us in Christ. In love, Father, you predestined us to be adopted through Jesus Christ according to your will. Just thinking about that, Father, puts so much comfort in our hearts because we know that as planned for adopted children, there is nothing we can do to earn or to lose your love. You have loved us unconditionally since before the foundation of everything. Father, that is why we're here this morning. We desire to know you more. We desire to follow you more. We desire to glorify you in all we do because you first loved us. So this morning, we ask that you open our ears so that we can hear what you're calling us to. We ask that you open our eyes to your ways. We are here in awe of you because of what you have done. And we come now before you all because of what our Savior Christ Jesus has accomplished on our behalf. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. So if you have your Bibles with you this morning, and I hope you do, would you open them up with me to Matthew chapter 3? We're going to be looking at verses 13 to 17 this morning. And as you're turning there, I want you to think about what we've witnessed so far in Matthew's gospel. We have witnessed Jesus. We've witnessed the fact that he is the descendant of Abraham. He's the promised one who has come, and it is through him that the nations are blessed. To top that off, Jesus is also the promised descendant of King David. He is the king who sits right now on his throne reigning over all. All authority has been given to him, and he judges the living and the dead. With that, we've also witnessed the angel of the Lord going to Joseph, proclaiming to him that this child, his bride is pregnant with. This child is the promised child of old. We have witnessed the amazing court, a court truly fit for a king through the wise men and their entourage who came bringing extravagant gifts and bowing down before Jesus to worship him. We have witnessed our heavenly father protect him as the offspring of the serpent has tried to kill the child of promise. And over the last two weeks, we have witnessed John the baptizer heralding the coming of the true king. This week, we will, we will be looking at how Jesus started his early ministry. Now with that, if you're able to stand, would you rise for the reading of the word of our king? That's Matthew chapter three, verses 13 to 17. Hear the word of the Lord. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. What we are witnessing here is so amazing. If you remember last week, I mentioned how the Pharisees and Sadducees, they came to watch what John the Baptist was doing. 
but they weren't coming to repent. They weren't even showing up to be baptized. They thought that they were fine in and of themselves. They came for the sole purpose of casting judgment on John, and yet John calls them out. In fact, John curses them. You brood of vipers, who warn you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Do not presume to say to yourself, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children from Abraham. And now the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So we have these Pharisees and Sadducees who have come to judge John, and John warns them that the king is coming. The king prophesied about all through the holy text, he is coming, and while I, John, baptize you with water for repentance, he is coming and he will baptize you with with water and with, or with the Holy Spirit and with fire. You know, as I said last week, this clearly points back to Ezekiel chapter 36, where the Lord promises to draw in all who are his, And in doing so, the Lord will sprinkle his people clean with water. He will take out their hearts of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Like, he will take these stone hearts and turn them into children of Abraham. And as he's doing that, he will put his Holy Spirit in his people, giving them the desire to keep his statutes and commandments. Whereas for those who are not his, even if they claim to be his, like the Pharisees and Sadducees, He will baptize them in eternal fires of judgment, the lake of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth and no respite from the eternal destruction. So we have these religious leaders on the one hand who think they're fine. They don't think they're sinners. And then in walks Jesus. Look with me at verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. So, on the one hand, you have supposedly holy people with the Pharisees and Sadducees who don't think they need to be baptized, they don't think they need to repent, they think they are good in and of themselves. And then here you have Jesus, who is coming to John the baptizer to be baptized. Now we're gonna look at John's response to Jesus in a minute, but have you ever asked yourself the question, why would Jesus need to be baptized? Especially if baptism is only for those who are believers in Jesus. Like seriously, if baptism is only for those who are believers in Jesus, let alone the fact that one day everyone will be baptized by the Lord, either in the Holy Spirit or with fire, but if baptism is only for those who are profess belief in Jesus, then why would Jesus himself need to be baptized? Doesn't he believe in himself? I mean, he's God, and we're gonna get an amazing look into that as well this morning. But why did Jesus need to be baptized unless there is something more involved with baptism? Kind of like the obedience. Unless there's something more involved with baptism, kind of like the stuff I've talked about over the last two weeks where over the last two weeks I have pointed to the fact that baptism is a covenant. And with covenants, with all covenants, there are blessings and curses that are associated with them. The blessing of baptism is that Jesus will wash you clean as the Father puts his spirit in you. Whereas the curse of baptism is, is that on the final day of judgment, the Lord will wash you away from his presence. Now it is true, up until this point in history, baptism wasn't the sign of the covenant. The sign of the covenant was circumcision. But baptism was still symbolic of the cleansing the Lord would do for his people in the new covenant. Which is why Ezekiel chapter 36 is so important to look to. The Lord has promised to sprinkle you clean with water. This is why Gentiles would get baptized. They'd heard the good news of the Lord. They heard of the promises of God and they were being physically washed knowing that it was God 
who is going to spiritually wash those who are his. The thing we have to realize, though, is for a Gentile, baptism was just the beginning. It was just a ritual cleansing. It did not bring you into the covenant community. Another thing I said over the last couple weeks is that if a father decided he wanted to become a follower of the Lord, he would take his whole family with him. He would not be cleansed alone, be, uh, alone because if he was cleansed alone, then he wouldn't be allowed to associate with the unclean Gentiles who were his family. They would symbolically be a stench to him. So the whole family would come and be baptized and then men, the men of the family, would then go through circumcision. Because at this point in history, in order to become a member, a covenant member of the community, all men had to be circumcised because that was the symbol. That was the sign of the covenant. But why did Jesus get baptized? And obedience is correct. Like what are we seeing here with the, be with the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry? Well, the apostle Paul in Romans chapter six gives us a little insight into this. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old selves were crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Jim, I, can I ask you a question? Can you turn me down just a little bit? I'm getting like, and I know you guys are probably getting that too. So Jesus getting, yes, Jesus getting baptized ushered in, I feel like I could let go now, the new covenant. Here with Jesus' baptism, he's making a statement, the old is done away with. The new has come. I, Jesus, I am the one who has come to cleanse you. I am the one who has come to cleanse my people because if I don't, if I break my own covenant with you, then I will be washed away into the floodwaters of destruction. What Jesus is doing here is exactly what the Lord did back in Genesis chapter 15 when the Lord initiated his covenant with Abraham, promising to Abraham that his descendants will be as numerous as the stars, and they will inherit the land that Abraham is sojourning in. I feel so much better. So, so the Lord had Abraham cut in half a three-year-old heifer. He had him cut in half three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram. He had him cut in half a turtle dove and a pigeon. And then the Lord alone walked through the cut up animals, making promises to Abraham, showing Abraham that if he, the Lord, did not keep those promises, then Abraham had every right to destroy God. You can destroy me if I don't keep my promises. If I don't fulfill what I'm promising to you right now, you can destroy me. The Lord, with this promise, was showing Abraham that he was going to do all the work Abraham just had to follow by faith. And it wasn't until Genesis chapter 17, after Abraham had faithfully been following the Lord for 24 years, that the sign of the covenant was given to Abraham, where he and all the males would be circumcised. Jesus here going down to be baptized is doing the exact same thing. This is why it is so important for us to understand covenants and the symbolism that goes along with them. Jesus doesn't need to be cleansed, just like the Lord didn't need to walk through the cut up animals. 
The Lord always keeps his promises. And Jesus, being the second person of the Godhead, well, he is pure. Jesus is holy. Jesus is blameless and spotless. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Amen. Which is actually what John the baptizer says in John chapter 1, when he first sees Jesus coming to him at the Jordan River. And because John the baptizer knows that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, well, when Jesus comes to him to be baptized, we see this little interaction that starts in verse 14. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? I mean, think about John's comment. I need to be baptized by you, Jesus. This is an amazing comment, and often we can just blow by it. I need to be baptized by you, says the guy who is preaching. Repent, for the kingdom of God, or kingdom of heaven is at hand. I need to be baptized by you, says the guy who is there baptizing others. This comment should cause us all to sit back humbly, recognizing that as disciples of the Lord, who have been completely forgiven by the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, well, it should cause us to sit back humbly because we realize we're still human. And because of that, we can often, and we do often, find ourselves walking in sin. Man, we are still imperfect sinners. And while we've been completely redeemed by the work of Christ, We still need the Lord to continue shaping and molding us into vessels of mercy. This reality, this fact that we could still find ourselves in sin, needing more and more of the grace of our Heavenly Father, well, it's with this reality that we should never think that we are better than those around us. No matter what sin they're walking in, no matter what sin they may have walked in, we should never think more highly of ourselves than we ought to because we're sinners who've been saved by grace. I feel like the leash was taken off of me. And as sinners saved by grace, we should walk humbly, knowing that Jesus is still cleansing us. This is why weekly we do communion here. We more often than not think, uh, we more often than not are still walking frustratingly into sin. And because of that, we need to cling to the promise that our heavenly Father has given us, meaning we need to constantly look to Christ. And concerning John the baptizer, he knows he's a sinner who needs Jesus. He knows he needs Jesus to cleanse him. And yet we see him calling others to repent as well. It's comforting to realize John needs Jesus just as much as everyone who is hearing the good news needs Jesus. And R.C. Sproul, says this about John the baptizer's comment here. The first audience of every preacher's sermon should be, and often is, himself. This is why we see here in the text, John recognizes that he has a need to be baptized by Jesus, who has come to meet his need, rather than the reverse. Now, John the baptizer knows that Jesus came to meet the needs of the people. That is why John is heralding the good news, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent for the king is coming and now we are watching the king come on the scene and the first thing we are shown concerning our king is that he goes to John asking to be baptized. So can you see the tension here? Can you see why John is pushing back? No, Lord, it is I who need to be baptized by you. Jesus, I am not worthy of you. I need you to cleanse me. I could never cleanse you. Causing Jesus to respond to John, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. It is fitting to fulfill all righteousness. For the Jew, fulfilling all righteousness meant that every jot and tittle of the law of God had to be fulfilled, meaning even the smallest, most minuscule, seemingly meaningless thing in the law must be fulfilled because the Lord's standard is perfection. The Lord has let us know, and obedience was the right word, The Lord has let us know that as his people, we are to be holy 
as God is holy. And Jesus here is showing us through example how we are to follow the Lord perfectly in obedience. We are to be completely obedient to the Lord because he is our king, which means we are to die to our old selves as the Lord is making us new. You know, when we looked at Romans chapter 12, there were two verses I said on repeat through the rest of our walk through Romans as we were winding down. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Like we are being told that we're not to be conformed to this world, but we're to be transformed by the renewal of the mind. This is why I quoted Romans 6 earlier. Do you not know, brothers and sisters, that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk walk in a newness of life. Like brothers and sisters, you're not to be conformed to the ways of the world. Remember, you were brought into the covenant, and in the covenant you were told to die to your old selves. Remember, it is through baptism that you were brought into the covenant through obedience, whether you, as an adult who had never been baptized, came forward at one point and were baptized, or you were an infant who was brought into the covenant because your parents We're obedient to the Lord, holding fast to the promises of God concerning you, their child. This is why your parents brought you into the covenant community. This is why your parents have been teaching you to observe all the commands the Lord has given us. We are called to go, make disciples, teach them after they're baptized. So either way, you were brought into the covenant community through obedience, just like Abraham and every God-fearing Jew throughout history who had brought their children into the covenant community through obedience. This is why, as one who has been baptized, it is the responsibility of the covenant community, every follower of Jesus, to care for one another. It is the responsibility of everyone in the covenant community to gently compassionately teach one another what it looks like to observe, to obey all the commandments of the Lord, pointing one another to Jesus at all times, not just when someone walks in sin, but pointing everyone to Jesus at all times so that each and every one of us walk more and more in obedience to God as he cleanses us. That's why Jesus was baptized. It was to fulfill all righteousness, which brings us to our final two verses this morning. Before we look at them though, I have to admit something. When I first came here to Parkman, I was a licensed minister in the Conservative Congregational Christian Conference. I would not been ordained yet and the truth was I was waiting for my call from a church. And when Parkman called me, I decided to wait a year before starting the process of ordination. This was because I didn't want to jump the gun. I wanted to go through a year of ministry to prove to myself that God was at work in me, but also to those around me that God had called me. Once I started the process, though, I had to go through something we call an ordination exam. Andrew went through just a minuscule exam. But this ordination exam is an oral exam. For this exam, I had to call a visnage council, which is just a council of lots of pastors, I brought in a few or a couple Presbyterian pastors. I brought in several congregational pastors. A Baptist minister came who's a great friend of mine as well as some of the local pastors in order to go through this process. They all received my ordination paper which laid out my theology. That word there just means the study of God through his word. But also they were understanding my doctrine which just means my teachings based on the word of God. Now, all these pastors read through my 18-page paper, and they had to prepare questions for me to answer. And that exam was four hours long. You know, during that exam, a question came up, and it was the only question I could not answer, causing me to 
freeze. And for those of you who know me, like know, know me, I can talk and talk and talk. But at this moment, I froze. I remember just staring at my Bible dumbfounded. I turned red and for like five minutes, five long, like eternally long minutes, during which I felt like I wanted to crawl into a hole and never come out. But for five minutes, I couldn't say a word. And graciously, the ordination committee helped me through this. The thing is, the question is such a simple question. A question, mind you, that I will never not know the answer to again. It's a question that ties in closely with what we're teaching our kids here in children's church and in the youth group, where we have two very simple questions that lead into this bigger question. How many gods are there? Do you guys know? Amen. The youth group sometimes gets it flipped. How many persons are there in the Godhead? Three. Three. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They are same in substance and equal in power and glory. Our kids, if they've been here long enough, know this is true and there is a good chance that they are now able to answer a question that a 37-year-old couldn't answer that morning. And I'm, I'm trying to build this up so much so that if you're asked this question in the future, you will not forget the answer to the question. And hopefully I've done that. So here's the question. Will, can you show us in scripture this morning where the Trinity is clearly presented? I froze. Such a simple question. Will, can you show us where the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are present together in the pages of scripture? Like that day I froze and I humbly sat there confident in one thing alone. I do not know everything. In fact, that morning I felt like I knew nothing at all. But if you were to ask me that question today, I'd take you to Genesis chapter one, and I'd show you the first few verses of how the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are working together to create everything that has been created. Or I'd walk you through some other places in scripture like John chapter one with the very word of God coming in the flesh. Today though, I want to show you an even clearer representation of our gracious Lord. So let's look at our final two verses. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove on and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. I mean, could the evidence of the Trinity be any more clear? Jesus is baptized. He has come to fulfill all righteousness. Every jot and tittle of the law of God is being fulfilled in Christ, the second person of the Trinity, the word of God made flesh. And here he comes up out of the water. The heavens open up, meaning the veil was removed. The Lord's earthly ministry was starting. And as the veil is removed, we're given this visual of the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit descending and resting upon Jesus like a dove. This here points back to Isaiah chapter 61, starting in verse one. The spirit of Adonai Yahweh is upon me because Yahweh has appointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the year of Yahweh's favor and the day of vengeance of our Elohim, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of Yahweh, that he may be glorified. Brothers and sisters, this is what Jesus came to do. The spirit of our master, our creator is resting on him. We see this in his anointing at the onset of his earthly ministry. And we know that Jesus came to bring good news to the poor. This is why Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of God. But that's not all brothers and sisters because Jesus came to bind up the brokenhearted. Which is why Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Brothers and sisters, this is what Jesus came to do, 
For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Jesus came to set the captives free because we were all slaves to sin and death. And we know that the wages of sin is death, which is why it is through the work Christ accomplished that you have been set free. Because while the wages of sin is death, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is why the symbolism of baptism is so important for you to hold on to. And it's why I've quoted Romans 6 several times today already. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism to death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. Like in Christ, you have been freed from the ramifications of sin and death, which means there is now no need for you to fear or mourn. Instead, all you need to do is trust in the Lord where he promises to provide for you in all things he promises, and men might not like this, but he promises to give you a beautiful headdress. He promises to give us garments of praise. He promises to give us oil of gladness so that we might be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of Yahweh, that he may be glorified. This is what Jesus came to do for you. And it's why he says to each and every one of us that we need to abide in him because he's the vine. We're just the branches. But there's more because while we get this beautiful symbolism, this visual of the Holy Spirit descending upon Jesus, anointing him for his earthly ministry, well, that's not the only thing we're being shown here because we're also given this amazing auditory confirmation from the first person of the Trinity where God the Father says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. You know, an obvious throwback to Psalm chapter two where the Lord says, you are my son. Today I have begotten you, ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. Jesus was promised to Abraham, you will, through you the nations will be blessed. This is what God is pointing to here, but we also see God pointing to this in Isaiah 42. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a fainting burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. I mean, talk about amazing grace. The father has sent his son with whom his soul delights. And Jesus has brought justice to the nations because one day we will all stand in judgment before him on his throne. And for those of you who are in Christ, man, he will not break the bruised reed or quench the fainting, burning wick. Meaning, brothers and sisters, if you are struggling with the ways of the world, like if you feel like there really is no hope, if, you're at, if you feel like you're in a pit of despair and you just can't go on, if you feel like you're all alone, like there is no one there to help you or even anyone who cares about you, well, hear me, this is why Jesus came. He didn't come to put more burdens on you. He didn't even come to make you feel worse about yourself because let's be honest, there's some people who've looked at the law of God and you're like, I can't keep the law on my own. Its weight has been crushing me for so long. That's why people walk away from the faith. They look at the weight of the law and they're trying to keep everything and they're like, I'm not perfect, I can't do this. There are others who just try to fake it until they make it. But the truth is Jesus did not come to put a heavy burden on you. He came with such a simple request all that he's asking of each and every one of you is that you would follow him. Because it is as you follow him that he washes you by the water of the word as he shapes you more and more into a vessel of mercy. This is why Jesus says to you, each and every one of you, collectively but individually, come to me, 
All who labor are heavy laden, and I, Jesus, will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Like This is the amazing grace of our Heavenly Father. He sent his Son to redeem you, and he sent his Holy Spirit so that you would have life. Let us pray. Father, we come before you this morning praising you for your word. We praise you that we're able to hear your promises, which remind us that it is in you where we find life, Father. We thank you that you have sent your, your word to us. We thank you that you always keep your promises because we're able to hold on to your promises, knowing that as we follow you, you will continue to do a good work in us until the day of completion when we're in your presence forever. Father, we ask you this morning that you bring encouragement to those who are struggling, that you refresh those who feel drained, that you open the eyes of those who don't know you. Father, we ask that you do what only you can do, which is draw in more and more of your lost sheep. And we thank you that all that is needed for that to happen is for your word to be proclaimed. Because it is through your word that we're able to come before you now, Father. We thank you for your word, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. As we're preparing to make our way to communion this morning, R.C. Sproul has a few, he poses a few questions in his commentary on this section. He pens, in the beginning of the last section of the book of Isaiah, we find God's announcement. Behold, my servant who I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. Is Christ your beloved? God is filled with affection for his only begotten son. Do you have affection in your heart for Christ? If there is no affection in your heart for him, you do not belong to him. Do you take pleasure in Christ? Are you well pleased with him? In the value system of God, God's love is poured out on his son. God's good pleasure is revealed towards his son. On another one of those occasions when God spoke audibly, he said, this is my beloved son, hear him. So if you love Christ, you hear him. If you do not listen to him, that is the clearest indication that there is no love for the son of God. That's how Sproul ends his commentary on this section. And it is true, do you have affections for Christ? If you do, hear him. Follow him. Jesus is going to say when we get to the parables that he speaks in parables to those who will indeed hear and never understand and will indeed see but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull and with their ears they can barely hear and their eyes they have closed lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. So can you hear Jesus? He is calling each and every one of us to follow him. He is calling us, like John the baptizer, to repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So repent and follow him. Which is why as we're preparing to make our way to communion this morning, let us first go before our heavenly Father in a time of self-examination. The Lord lets us know in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that we are to examine ourselves against the word. It is as we examine ourselves against the word where we are able to see areas in our lives that we may be in rebellion. And with that, we are able to go to our heavenly father repenting. So let us spend some time this morning confessing our sins to the Lord. Let us pray.